fortunate to have Ryan Pesch talking to us today about the uh, financial analysis side of things, particularly focused at farmers market vendors or farmers who may consider selling through a farmers market hub. So Ryan, I'm going to hand it over to you and I'm going to stop my share so you can put up your slides. Okay. Well, great. Uh, I appreciate y'all coming here today. It's that odd week, you know, between Christmas and New Year's where all email comes to a standstill and you get a sense like not much is going on, right? <laughs> so, so hopefully you said, oh, well, I, I'm going to come on this webinar. Passed. Sounds great. The 2000 um, stimulus thing. Yeah. And so it's now just at the Senate today. Let's okay, if mute folks Kelsey, could mute if you're, if you're not Ryan, please. <laughs> That's good. And so, so here we are. Now I'm going to just get up some little, but it's been fun being part of this project. Like as Jane introduced, I mean, it's uh, quite a partnership from a number of organizations exploring this idea of farmers market aggregation. And uh, I get to be part of that and um, working directly uh, with uh, producers and farm operators uh, trying to figure out from their point of view as well as the point of view of the uh, farmers market managers, you know, does this thing make sense, right? And, you know, I've, I've been at some of these things uh, long enough. That just seems like the appropriate question. We get all excited. We want to get good foods in the hands of people, what is the most efficient way of doing that? Um, for operators, what is the most profitable way of doing that? Um, and and so this is one 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 such way that uh, has been explored to, to say we can supply a customer base, and in doing so, um, customers get what they want, and and farmers find some profitability and efficiency in what they're doing. And so. Jane already talked about this, but here's a whole bunch of logos. So there you go, a whole bunch of. Um, why am I here? I don't know. I guess I always had to introduce myself with things like this, that I have this dual life. So on the left, I'm Ryan Pesh, extension educator, where apparently we should all wear plaid all the time. I'm very good at looking the part. See, the last time I presented, I was wearing the same shirt. My wife, <laughs> my wife is like, you only own three shirts. And I'm like, well, this is the second one. I still got one more. Um, but I can uh, play the part of extension educator, right? It's like plaid shirt, get out in the field. You know, what I end up doing, uh, I do work for the Center for Community Vitality, where I do a fair amount of market, market analysis, oftentimes with uh, EDAs and cities. Uh, I'm out here in Otter Tail County, so I work primarily in West Central Minnesota. And oftentimes just picture sort of an abandoned main street where people are like, there's a lot of vacancies on this main street. Can't there be some kind of business that makes sense? And so I do a fair amount of that retail market analysis, but because I have this other life as Ryan Pesh extension educator, uh, as Ryan Pesh commercial vegetable operator, I should say, um, there's me by a farm stand, my family and the workforce at Light of Farm on the right. Uh, I end up, you know, basically taking some of my skills and abilities in the world of market analysis and financial analysis and then apply it to the local food, mm -hmm. if you will. So I'm always getting these questions like, is anybody making any money doing this? It's, it's usually the question. And so I typically end up working on what I call the orphan enterprises. Um, you know, there's, there, there are a number of other people in extension and in Minsk that do a lot of work around farm financial analysis in the dairy industry, corn, soybeans. If you want those numbers, they're, they're yeah. found. And uh, I'm one of the few people in the state that will say, okay, uh, let's look at commercial vegetable operators and try to sort out all their kind of crazy numbers uh, to see if they're make, anybody's making any money. We've, I've done some work on pasture poultry production, uh, winter greens, uh, the most downloaded uh, report I've ever done though is uh, the garlic enterprise analysis that I did last year. So people are really into like, is anybody making any money raising garlic? So these are the questions I deal with. So I was brought in to say, hey, okay, let's take a look at this 
farmers market aggregation thing, Ryan, and help us sort this thing out. So in terms of agenda today, I, it's kind of three parts. Uh, since I'm, I really try to gear this primarily to other op farmers and operators. Um, I'm going to, uh, the first two parts are really focused on, on that. That is, you know, uh, we got good data uh, from this project about how commercial vegetable operators are doing financially. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, second, we'll take a look at um, what I call marketing mix analysis to say how, how people are selling their products, uh, which of them have a higher relative return compared to others. So if you're selling in a CSA and a farmer's market, how do those things compare? Uh, and also then let's take a closer look at if I'm selling through the aggregation or the farmer's market hub, uh, how does that play into the other outlets that I'm managing, the other ways I'm selling um, the, the foods that I'm selling. And lastly, we'll take a, a quick look at how uh, the farmer's market aggregation markets performed uh, themselves uh, here in 2020. And then along the way, I'm gonna hit stop and then there'll be time for some discussion as well as uh, as any kind of questions because this gets to be kind of detailed. <laughs> and sometimes, especially on a webinar, you honestly don't know if anybody's getting it, right? Because it's just like me in my living room, like talking at you <laughs> and I don't really see you. And so it's it's kind of funny. So- yep, uh, And this is Jane, I'll jump in for just a second yeah. and say if you have questions that come up as Ryan's going along, please toss those in the chat and Brett Olson from Renewing the Countryside and I will be monitoring that and we'll make sure that Ryan gets those questions in the chat. That's, that's awesome. And there's no dumb question whatsoever, right? So I always, I do this presentation thinking that people are gonna be at very different places. Like, hey, I'm in year two or year one uh, being a commercial veggie operator, Ryan, I'm really interested in this, but I don't know half of what you're talking about. What actually is an operating profit margin? And what are these kinds of things? really legitimate things to ask about. Um, and um, there, if you want to kind of get fancy and sophisticated, ask, ask those questions to ask hard questions, easy questions, anything in between, I don't care. Uh, we'll, we'll see if I can answer it. Uh, so we had 17 farm operators uh, engaged uh, in this project. And uh, there's a huge distribution. The variability is great. This is the third time I've collected data from commercial vegetable operators and the variability is really wide, let's say. And so in terms of sales, right, between 1,600 and almost a quarter million dollars in sales between the, the, the one with the least amount of sales and the one with the most amount of sales. That doesn't mean those are the most, one's the most profitable, one's the least profitable actually, but uh, that's a difference in sales. Uh, in terms of size, uh, went down to a 10th of an acre there were a number of farms that we'd call micro farms, uh, less than an acre. And the biggest was at 22 acres of production, that is vegetable production. Maybe the farm was 40 acres in size, but they used 22 of those acres for growing produce. And so when I'm talking about acreage, that's what I'm, I'm referring to in terms of the, 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 the size in the amount in produce. Although there were some really huge differences between these farms uh, and a lot of variability, there were some similarities. All of them sold that at at least one farmer's market. Everybody sold it at least one farmer's market. Some of them at their farmer's market engaged in the aggregation project and some of them didn't. Um, also, some of them were, all were sole proprietors. Nobody was like this corporation or an S corp or a C corp or any of these kinds of things. So, that just, it just in terms of getting the accounting straight for everybody, uh, there wasn't any proprietor income that was in as a business expense, right? So the way, if we look at net farm income, uh, whatever net farm income there was, that essentially was their return to management and labor. So if I, I made $100,000, I spent $80,000 to make that 100,000, and after depreciation, everything, I had $10,000 in my pocket, net farm income. Uh, I wasn't paying myself along the way, right? Just to keep it kind of clear. 
that $10,000 is what I got for my time and effort for that year. That's, that's what we're talking about with uh, that return to management labor. In terms of the process, uh, basically we, we did uh, a FinPAC analysis with all 17 of these operations. And uh, so for FinPAC people, we did a FinNAN <laughs> uh, for people that's insider baseball, if you're not familiar with it. But uh, to do that, uh, what we do is we do a beginning balance sheet and an ending balance sheet, right? What's our assets and liabilities at the beginning of this year? What's our assets and liabilities at the end of the year? And then we also did an income statement that is accrued using inventory adjustments, right? So um, how, if you were a meat, if you did meat sales, if you had $10,000 worth of meat in a freezer at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, there was nothing in that freezer that has to be accounted for in this income statement. You're like, oh boy, I, I made no money, but actually, you know, you changed your, you changed your inventory. So that, that is, we, we tracked all expenses over that year. Um, and then we also tracked the income over that year. Uh, the second part that we did is, uh, was a, a marketing mix analysis. So um, as if the Finan wasn't evol involved enough, <laughs> uh, we broke out, uh, folks shared uh, their sales by outlet or sales by marketing channel, right? So I had this amount of sales in the CSA, I had this amount of sales that were wholesale, and I had this amount of sales that were at this farmer's market and this farmer's market and that farmer's market. And then we also said, okay, how, what's your time in terms of post harvest in terms of engaging in that market channel or that outlet, whether CSA, whether at that farmer's market. So in terms of farmer's market, you drove to and back from the farmer's market time, you spent time at that market, you paid a market fee, you maybe bought an awning, you maybe did some advertising, right? And so we try to do that in a way that's this apples to apples comparison to create a market mix analysis. So I'll get into that. And this was involved, right? So this isn't like Ryan sending out uh, a survey monkey and saying, hey, what were your sales and what were your expenses and how much did you make last year? No, uh, this was an interview format where people spent, mm -hmm. I think between two and five hours with Ryan to get follow up around some of the details to make sure that this was done as well as possible, right? Um, all of us have some record keeping issues, <laughs> right? But uh, this was a very involved process. And so um, it's quite detailed. Just to say it's good data. It's not like Ryan spitballing things, okay? So a little more about uh, just sort of about our farms and their financial performance. Uh, Again, a lot of variability uh, in terms of operating profit margin. Uh, one, negative 254, I don't know how to say that, right? Uh, but the highest was at a 63% uh, operating profit margin, uh, which is really great. <laughs> um, and in terms of a, um, what I call as a gross marketing margin is turnover marketing costs at farmers markets. Um, there, there was also quite a distribution. Um, and and the, way, the way to think about this gross margin is, so for every dollar that you're getting at a farmer's market, after you subtract out all those marketing costs to, to sell there, how much are you retaining? How much are you holding on to? And so uh, one was, a couple were negative or one was negative. Uh, the highest was 83%, so keeping 83 cents mm -hmm. of and the median was uh, 48 percent, keeping 48 cents of every dollar. See, it gets detailed. So hang with me, folks. You're like, oh goodness, Ryan is just beating me over the head with numbers. But um, this, I'm trying to tell it as a story. Um, so if we look at how those, where those farms were at, uh, in terms of of their performance, the average net cash farm income uh, for the year we collected. It was an average of a little over $12,000. So these are not huge operations. That is net cash farm income. That doesn't include depreciation. Uh, but to give a sense about how big are these operations um, in terms of their balance sheet, their uh, beginning farm assets at the beginning of the year that we collected was 268,000, ending of 286,000. 
So there's an increase in the amount of farm assets. These are farms that are investing in their farms. If you will, you bought another tract, you bought a tractor for $20,000, that's worth 20,000. You added $20,000 to those assets, right? Uh, they also decreased their uh, average farm liability over that time uh, from the beginning of 115,000, there should be a K there, to an ending of 108,000. So you get a sense kind of the scale of these operations. So somebody that might be a thing, you know, 1200 acre soybean operations, like what? That's this tiny little, tiny little thing, right? Uh, but for other people operating small businesses, I mean, these are not insignificant businesses either, right? So, so how did we, how did these uh, operations perform? We looked at two things. We looked at the, uh, the whole farm, right? So the operation, so each farm could have multiple enterprises, right? So in a farm, I could sell hogs and sell at a farmer's market, right? And I might do sheep on the side. I have three different enterprises. Uh, so we did some analysis at the whole farm level the vast majority of all these sales for all of these farms came from commercial vegetable production. Very little came from livestock or other crops, uh, to give you a sense. And so we looked at, looked at that. And then we also looked at just the vegetable enterprise in particular. So I had done some, some research, like I said, in central Minnesota some years back. I think uh, we're looking at your data from 2015. Uh, in terms of the vegetable enterprise, very, this group was very much on par in terms of their total sales gross sales per acre. So in the, the group that uh, we got data from was about $9,000 per acre. Uh, their net return was a little more than $3,000 per acre. Uh, that, is, uh, that is the net. We've taken out all the overhead costs and direct costs related to vegetable production. Uh, in my 2015 group, that was negative. So. The cost per acre of vegetables, um, Again, comparing this 2015 data to, the, to this data in the, for the aggregation project as a benchmark, uh, we see some interesting differences here. Um, their, their direct costs were higher per acre uh, than my previous group, but their overhead costs were significantly lower. So again, it only takes a few people in the small data set to kind of make these numbers go wonky. Right, <laughs> but uh, direct direct expenses are are things like fertilizer, um, seed costs, remay supplies, those types of things. Whereas overhead is like I'm paying my accountant, I'm paying for property taxes, and these types of things. So um, that's that's how that broke down overhead versus direct. In terms of the whole farm, again, if we just we're adding in any other enterprises that they might've had, although the majority of their sales came from commercial vegetable production. Um, comparing the two groups, again, that rate of return on assets was very, very similar. Uh, the 2019 group was four and a half percent. I did look up some stuff from the Center for Farm Financial Management as a benchmark from their fin, FinBin database. So for example, dairy in 2018 was like a 1% return on assets. And so I really like this measure because it's like, uh, for me as a vegetable operator, I can sort of say, well, if I had a, if I had a thousand dollars, where could I invest it? I could take and invest it in an index fund, or I could take and invest it in my own farm and I could buy another tool or I could buy something. Where am I going to get a better return? And that's kind of what we're talking about here in a rate of return of assets. Uh, our 2019 group, uh, their operating profit margin, uh, was a little, a little bit lower, uh, than the 2015 group. Um, but that's because they had that higher direct cost. So um, lastly, in terms of the whole farm, uh, their uh, debt to asset ratio uh, was a bit lower uh, than the 2015 group. And over the time that uh, we did the FinAn with them, they in, had a, a much more significant change in total net worth um, to the good, <laughs> you know, positive change in net worth of 17%. So that's quite significant. So again, these are farms that are adding assets and are decreasing liabilities um, over, over the course of the year that we had data from, for them. Okay, all right, Ryan now's beat you over the head with a whole bunch of FinPAC numbers. 
There have to be uh, yeah, right. there's, a, there's a question in the chat from Jack McCann, and I'm not certain that I understand the question, so I'll read it. And then Jack, if you want to jump in and clarify, that would be good. So the operating margin is only subtracting marketing expense and labor for their direct sales or what is included there. Then operating margin subtracts further supplies slash inputs to the farming business. Is that correct? Yeah, sorry, I had a typo there. I was asking about the um, the difference between the operating profit margin and the gross margin. So I, I used operating margin twice in my question, which made it very, very confusing. But what's actually included there, the gross margin, is that just the, um, like if I sell a dollar at the farmer's market, it costs me 50 cents yep. you know, to sell that my margin is 50, yep. 50 percent at just for sales, but then it doesn't include my cost of goods sold to create that, and you're further subtracting it out to get the operating margin? Yeah. So I'm going to go to this part next. It's, um, <clears throat> you're correct. I, I, I kind of made up this term. So if somebody's smarter on, in farm business management, they can, they can beat me up or send me a note or something about it. Um, it's essentially gross margin analysis. It, I call it like gross marketing margin. It's the return over marketing costs. That's the part I'm going to get into next. I gave you a little preview of some of those numbers. That is, if I'm doing a dollar of sales at the farmer's market, yes, let, let us subtract out just the marketing costs and what are you still retaining after that? Whereas that operating profit margin was after de taking out your cost of producing that good, that cost of goods. So yeah, you're understanding that correct. And, and in this next section, I'll get a little more into that, that um, gross marketing margin, let's call it, or the return over uh, marketing costs. So you're one outlier that had a negative gross marketing margin. For example, they may have hired someone to run the farmer's market for them, and that person cost more money than the total sales that person provided. Yep. And, and I think in that particular instance, what was going on is they had very low farmer's market sales. And just by the nature of the, the costs, if they go, you go 10 times to a farmer's market, just, just the mileage and the time there and back and at the farmer's market alone at $10 an hour, they, they went backwards. That, that's what was going on. Uh, I don't think they hired somebody. I don't know if, I don't think anybody hired anybody. Uh, to run a market stall that were in this study. Okay, Ryan, a couple more questions in the chat. Um, from slide number one, did the biggest acreage have the most sales and the smallest acreage have the least? The biggest acreage did have the most sales, yes. Uh, and in terms of this group, they were very much the outlier. That one farm that was 22 acres, they were the near quarter million dollars in sales. Um, your second, the second largest one was we we're maybe at like six acres, five or six and then smaller, right? So you had a whole, everybody was under, let's say five or six acres. And then there was one person out here with 22. And so just to give you a sense of that distribution, in terms of was the smallest the least, I, I'm not 100%. This is just me trying to recall the numbers and how they laid out. We had some of our smallest operators were very deep into high turnover greens and such. So that isn't necessarily the case. I think some of them had some very, <laughs> the, 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 there's definitely one I can think of that had more than 1600. That was really at that small end. I don't know if they were a 0.1 or a 0.2, but. Any other hard questions or easy questions? Give me an easy one. Yeah, there's another question. Um, both two of them on uh, COVID uh, and its impact. Do you have any measurements on that, or guesses? Or well, uh, we'll we'll see the impact on the aggregation sales. But if I were just gonna, I'm just gonna back up and speak anecdotally because I didn't collect data here in 2020 in comparison to what we collected in 2019, right? That would be, that would be the, best, <laughs> the best answer. But uh, from my own experience, for example, I mean, I've been a CSA operator now since 2004 here in Otter Tail County. And like we, 
added 15 shares or 15 boxes, which is more like 20 odd shares. And we sold though out of those darn things in April, whereas we're normally selling out of our last CSA share sometime in May or June. So I, I know from my own experience, um, we do CSA, we also do, we, I've dropped farmer's market and we do some farm stands. The farm stand probably had, I'm guessing like 60% more sales than the year previous. Again, it's an example of a, a market outlet where people can very much socially distance. They can come at their leisure. They don't have to go into a store. Uh, so some of those headaches that might relate to um, regular shopping that you've typically dealt with, uh, working in a, going into a store and, and purchasing something, um, that was gotten around with, with my farm stand. And I think CSA definitely worked the same way. Not unlike what we're talking about uh, with aggregation, where it, um, whether it's a, a farmer's market, market basket that people bought at through sort of a drive up farmer's market way, you're able to safely get the product you need and it gets, kind of gets delivered to you, right? And so at least from my own personal experience, those two things were kind of off the charts this year. It made me tired. <laughs> Well, okay, fun. thanks, Ryan. I think we're ready to move on oh, to your okay. next set. Great, great. Okay. What time is it, Jane? One thirty. Okay. All right. There. Oh, very good. Thank you. All right. Good. So, uh, this next part, let's get a little more into marketing costs. So, I'd like to give you, uh, to give you a sense about how I th thought through this project and how I've thought about the profitability of commercial vegetable operators, myself included for some time, is I think there, we, ought, we justifiably need to pay close attention to what I call marketing costs. So sometimes when I say that, everyone, everybody who equates marketing with advertising will just say, I don't spend that much on advertising. What are you talking about? All these marketing costs I should pay attention to, Ryan. Well, marketing costs, are a lot more than just an advertising cost. Advertising costs are part of that, but there are a lot of costs in gate. When I mean marketing costs, I mean with all the costs related to product from the farm to the customer, right? Um, if, if we hold those production costs constant, the main differential uh, in terms of how profitable something is has to do with these marketing costs. If I'm driving three counties over to deliver a flat of tomatoes versus five miles, there's a significant difference uh, in, in terms of my overall profitability on that one flat of tomatoes. And so uh, are all sales created equal? By no means. It, it has everything to do with, I think, sorting out our marketing costs and being tight on our marketing costs as producers. You know, so that little map there sort of, <laughs> sort of me trying to represent what a, a local food veggie operator looks like, right? What does their life look like? They live over by Cambridge, they go to Elk River one day for a market, and then they go back to Cambridge, and then they go over to North Branch or by Forest Lake, and then they go to Princeton. And while they're in Princeton, they drop off at a restaurant, and they have this other, since they have this restaurant account, they drop a, a couple things off to this one grocery store, and it just, it just, I call it the hamster wheel, the seasonal hamster wheel. We get on, kind of schlepping product around. Uh, and so to say that our, um, <laughs> these marketing costs don't matter, they matter a lot. Whereas if I'm a farm near Cambridge, a dollar that I get in Cambridge is worth more to me than a dollar in Princeton. So I don't, it just, sorry, it took me too long to say that, but that's pretty much what we're talking about. Um, and so the farms that this is what we found when I looked at commercial vegetable operations some uh, years ago. Um, and what I know from just talking to other commercial operators, and it's definitely the case with the farms that engaged in this study as well, is that it isn't just I sell at farmer's markets and that's how I do it. Some people it's that simple, but a lot of commercial vegetable operators, they manage a marketing mix, right? And so the sweet spot, the, uh, the real magic of profitably running a commercial vegetable operation, I think is managing this marketing mix well. And so this is a representation, this table 
about how these different 17 farms laid out and how they were selling, right? We see seven of them that were involved in aggregation, but five were involved that they did wholesale or they sold to a food, food hub. Um, what we have seven that were engaged in either direct to restaurant, direct to retail, direct to a grocery, uh, four operated farm stands, four, four had a CSA. If you look across the row, you can see, <laughs> I mean, we have farm I there that had, you know, two market channels that went to seven different farmers markets. And so it's kind of like, ah, this is the life of a commercial vegetable operator. And if you manage it well, uh, you can be profitable. If you mismanage it, you can dump so much money into marketing costs that you're never going to get profitable. And so that's Ryan's take on life in terms of how to, how to do this. So what we do is a marketing mix analysis to try to sort this out as opposed to just like pulling on our hair and saying, oh, I don't know, I'm so frustrated. I have all these customers, I don't know what to do. It, so it isn't like every sale is a good sale. What we try to do is do an apples to apples comparison across each outlet or market channel. Uh, we try to just say, you know, our cost of production is our cost of production. Let us just look a little more carefully at those marketing costs and give a kind of an apples to apples comparison. So this is where we come into this uh, gross marketing margin. Again, I think I made that up. I don't know. But <clears throat> basically, it's your return over your marketing costs related to that outlet. So here's our example. And if you've seen this before, I'm sorry. I just like, I just keep reusing old stuff. Uh, one operation might sell two farmers markets, a farm stand, sell to a grocery, sell to a school. They have different sales in the top row. They have um, different numbers of times that they're going. But as a point of comparison, if we look at farmer's market one, farmer's market two, one has more sales than the other, right? Farmer's market one, we did 2,000 in sales. Let's add up our marketing costs. Let's look at our, our cost of travel or mileage, right? This is just me taking the, you know, 54 and a half cents per mile times your round trip. Uh, what's your time? I did everybody at just $10 an hour. We could have done it all at $15 an hour. Again, across the board in terms of time, I'm sure one farmer's time is worth more than another farmer's, right? I didn't get into that. I just wanted apples to apples comparison. What are our fees on a daily basis? What are the total costs? We also will add in, and I have added in, things like, yeah, I bought signage, I bought our advertising that, I, that, that was just for me at that market, to kind of promote me at being at that market. Uh, I bought some tables, I bought a canopy, all these kinds of things uh, that typically relate to that, that outlet. So we get that total amount of cost, uh, we subtract that from the total sales, and then we turn it into a gross margin, which is just saying you do the net, net return, you divide it by the total sales. And again, you read it the same way. For every dollar of sales at that farmer's market one, I'm keeping 40, 47 cents. Farmer's market two, for every dollar of sales, even though there's more sales there, because of the marketing costs, I'm only keeping 23 cents of every dollar, right? Everything else is just going to me getting there and spending time there, right? And people think differently about my time, their time there, but still all we're trying to do is get to an apples to apples comparison. And so this is what we do. If you have the marketing mix, you might have three different market outlets. You might have 20. I don't know, but you do the math the same way and you compare them. And so even if there's that your I always say even if your your marketing your return isn't that much better your margin isn't that is is worse in one place you might still stay there for some reason um, it might be a brand new market you might think that that market's going to grow over time in a way that your other market might decrease over time there's a lot of strategic reasons to stay in the outlet you're in uh, even if it doesn't have a high payback and a lot of times a lot of producers will be like you know. I don't get a great return at that, that particular farmer's market, but that market, we also do our CSA delivery. So, you know, that's, that is a drop side that kind of works for us, or it's a good market. And we think we're going to get more customers there for our CSA or for another part of our business over time. Um, that's, that's how these things work. So I did a, a fact sheet on this that I, we could get out to everybody later about doing a market market mix analysis. Uh, for farm operators, uh, which just kind of lays this out. 
Well, you're probably sick of me talking about how to do the calculation. Just give us the results, Ryan. So where do we stand with farmers markets? From 17 operators, um, we had a 67% gross margin at farmers markets. That was, that was lower than the other, the other market channels. Um, so again, <clears throat> we had 317,000 in sales across the 17 operations and all their farmers markets. They spent 106,000 in marketing costs. Uh, in order to get that 317,000. Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. You make up your mind. <laughs> in comparison to some of the other market channels, it was at least profitable, right? Uh, direct is direct to retail or grocery. Stand is farm stand, keeping 84 cents of a dollar, which is very consistent with the, uh, the data we had collected earlier, five, six years ago. Uh, CSA is 86% and wholesale 92%. But again, think wholesale uh, larger lots, lower marketing costs, right? And so th <clears throat> there's a, there could be a differential there that I'm unable to parse apart right now if in terms, in terms of pricing, right? And so what does this look like for aggregation and where does aggregation fit in on this? We almost do like kind of a partial budgeting thing in order to kind of sort this out. But <clears throat> this is the data from one of the 17 farms that did involve an aggregation, right? So 2019, they didn't have many aggregation sales. And, and so in terms of the report, it was very difficult to say, yeah, aggregation is really driving these businesses. It wasn't. It wasn't in 2019, in large part, because aggregation sales all told were not that large. And as a percent of any, any of those operator sales, it wasn't that big. And so, this is what it looked like for one operator, $9,500 in sales, they had $100 in aggregation sales. Uh, their gross margin, that particular farmer's, uh, that particular farmer's market was 67%. Uh, here's the data from the real life data from another, uh, another operator. And to give you a sense about how this might scale with time or maybe has scaled in 2020, uh, this, this operator had farmer's market, no aggregation. Again, the same kind of analysis we did with the market mix analysis at a gross margin of 38%. Uh, and you can just see just how that gross margin changes if those other things remain constant, which we assume would remain constant, right? That is, I'm not taking on any more mileage to get to and from that farmer's market if I'm doing aggregation. Uh, I'm just bringing more product. And as long as that product isn't substituting the current product, right? If you're just swapping out $1,000 of aggregation sales and you have $1,000 less in farmer's market sales, well, then the math doesn't work out nearly as well. But assuming that we're just adding on these aggregation sales to existing farmer's market sales, we are improving this gross margin, right? We're just getting more sales for the same amount of marketing costs that are already dumped in each outlet, right? And so you can see how that improves the gross margin over time. The wild card here, and we heard some about this uh, with 2020 is that selling time cost, right? I'm assuming it remains constant, but some of what we hear is that, well, more sales, there might actually be more uh, post-harvest handling related to those particular sales or particular costs related to more of those sales, right? If I have to start buying boxes and spending a half hour gathering and organizing each of those sales, that number would change. So I wanna flag that even though I can't say that that's really what's going on because I haven't collected everybody's <laughs> data 2020 to 2019. Now this is in a scenario like some markets are doing where they're passing those fees on to the customer, right? So the farmer remains the same, but even if some of the markets do say, I did $100 in sales, now I'm going to incur a 14% fee essentially to the market for engaging in aggregation, even taking into consideration those fees that come to the, if they went to the farmer, you're still improving that gross marketing margin. And so that's, that's kind of how this looks. All right, now I'm talking in circles again, and I'm stopping. <laughs> Any questions about how we measured this or, or even just a point about what that looked like to you or, you know, 
point about your own trade-offs by market channel? Uh, there aren't any questions in the chat, Ryan, and we're at 1.43, so maybe you should oh, just, just continue keep... on. Okay, <laughs> this, is, this is shortest part too. So aggregation 2018, 2019, this is what it looked like. What do we know? Uh, these were the markets that participated. Um, again, pretty modest, right? I guess this is part of the story, it's pretty modest. Um, almost 10,000 in, in total sales across all the markets in 2018. Uh, pushing 15,000 in 2019. So there's growth, it's good, uh, but it wasn't like, you know, off the charts kind of stuff. Uh, this is what it looked like for the producers uh, in terms of those that did engage in aggregation, 2018 to 2019, what are their average sales and their median sales, right? Average sales of $214 in 2019, median sales of $22. When you have that big, gap between the average and the median you just know that there are some some operators that are doing a majority of the sales and a number of small operators are just doing small amounts of sales um there's some change in part because there were just more people more vendors that were involved in aggregation 39 in 2018 51 in 2019 and 51 of them had sales in 2019. 2020 uh this is that covid question i don't know it's like for two years, people have been working on this aggregation and maybe it just got to the place where it's right time, right place, right? We've had some practice doing aggregation, aggregating product and selling it through an online hub. Um, boy, uh, you see a difference in the data. And so from 15,000, we went to 265,000 uh, in sales across the participating market, uh, over 38,000 transactions. And so I haven't fully fleshed this stuff out because there's a lot of transactions. In terms of suppliers and the vendors, 125 vendors engaged, up from 51. And in terms of their average sales and the like, right? Um, 1,900 in average sales, a median of 366 in comparison to $22 the year before. Uh, again, big variability. The highest operator doing over 29,000 and the lowest, doing $2.50. <laughs> so there's one, one supplier with one transaction. <clears throat> I just don't remember what that was. From our own operators, the question came up and the last time I spoke is like, how did the people that you got numbers from fare, Ryan, um, from 2019 to 2020? So seven operators engaged in aggregation that I have numbers for 2019, three of them then added on. So we're up to 10. 10 of those operators, 10 of the 17, uh, were engaged in aggregation in 2020. Uh, their average sales went up, right? From 518 uh, to over $1,200. Uh, if I take out the three that didn't participate in 2019, uh, that number goes up to close to $1,500 uh, in 2020. So in terms of an average sales. Uh, this is just the product mix I'm not gonna get into for sake of time. But there was, this is the mix from 2018 and 2019 and how it changed. Uh, the large story was the market share that people were doing. But I think it's more interesting just to jump to look at, at 2020. Um, maybe evidence of COVID stress eating, <laughs> right? A lot of meat and a lot of carbs were uh, sold through the hub. Um, I put this one, pie, blueberry, lime, tart, tiny, because, uh, well, it was the highest pastry in, in the data set, it kind of sounded good. So $1,200 of those things were sold. Uh, but bread got up there, uh, chicken and beef, right? I think we all remember the story of hunting for, hunting for meat, right? We just went into hunter-gatherer mode there for a while. And, uh, and beef, chicken, pork isn't listed here, but it was also quite high. And, uh, and that also explains some of that distribution where some operators had some very high sales. Uh, those operators were Meat, uh, meat vendors. Tomatoes, uh, almost 10,000 tomatoes. It's not as big, but there's a wider distribution of products. And so each of them had some thousands of sales all aggregated get together. Veggies, I'm certain, were, was probably was the biggest. Uh, there was a lot of talk about market share, that is assembling a box from multiple vendors together and then selling it uh, to a customer. Um, 
although it was almost 50% of sales in 2019, is only 8% of sales in 2020. So it's kind of, I think, a sign that the hub was kind of working the way it was initially thought of, that people would do all the cart transactions and add a mix of things into a cart and check out. And so um, that's what we have here. Uh, in terms of, of markets, uh, we talked about this uh, more uh, before I did a presentation just for market managers. Um, you know, we're talking about break even and how to make this thing work uh, for the market side, but that isn't nearly as much of, a, of an interest for us today. We're trying to uh, concentrate on, on growers. So maybe back to the COVID question, I, I think it's a good thing to, to end on is, uh, obviously there was a lot of interest uh, in the farmer's market hub this year. Is that, is that only due to COVID, right? Um, what do you think? I mean, is this just a COVID bump? Have we moved into I don't know, the new farmer's market model for the 21st century? And this is just how we're gonna shop from here on? Um, did we have a COVID bump and we made some new relationships with customers that we didn't have before? Some will carry on and some want to go back to their old habits. Um, maybe we're all just going to go back to our old habits and we're really sick of doing Zoom meetings and online transactions. We, we, we want nothing but face-to-face -face <laughs> from here on out uh, post-vaccine. Um, so uh, I think this is a good discussion point. I, I would leave it here. Uh, for those that, that are our operators and um, you maybe got on here just to sort of think through your own business planning and think about, you know, am I making money as a commercial vegetable operator? Hey, it, now is the time uh, to organize your numbers. I'm a firm believer. Sometimes I always talk to operating <laughs> farmers and they're like, well, my accountant says I need to do this. Well, it's not for your accountant. Um, it's for you. Um, whether it's doing a marketing mix analysis or getting that balance sheet together, really doing an income statement well and right. Um, this is the type of work that is absolutely necessary amongst uh, farm operators like myself in order that we can make some good and strategic decisions so that we are more profitable in 2021, maybe than we were in 2022, even if 2020 or 2020 was, was all right. So um, this is when people should say something. Yeah, so any questions, if people want to go ahead and unmute and ask a question, that's fine. If you'd rather type it in the chat, Brett or I, I'll read it for you. Or it could just be some feedback about how you're viewing this things or your thoughts on um, the impact of COVID or where do we go from here or just business planning in general, right? Or issues with... Yeah, Ryan, maybe what you could do is um, say what kind of advice you would give to one of the kind of middle of the pack farmers in this study, if they were thinking about whether to continue selling through aggregation um, next year, what kind of advice would you give them? My advice is always to, to pay attention to your marketing costs and although you might have some long-standing relationships for your own profitability, you need to decide whether you stay or go, right? I find a lot of producers stay in a market that may not be profitable for them simply because they feel like they're going to either let down their fellow vendors, they're going to let down the half a dozen customers who come there every single week, right? I've, I've done this. I've walked away from a market where I was doing very good money, uh, but it actually made sense for me to concentrate on some of those other outlets I had and cut back on my farmer's market outlet. Um, in terms of aggregation, for those outlets, that farmer's market that you're like, yep, I'm here, this works for me, uh, they have aggregation. The advice is the, the aggregation will allow you for more sales, right? So if you're investing the time and the marketing cost for that particular farmer's market, the aggregation can allow you to kind of capitalize on your investment in those marketing costs and have other sales brought in because you're already incurring the costs, right? So cut outlets that don't make sense or are kind of dogs. It's okay to do that. I wanna give you permission to do that. And, and if you are engaged and you remain, 
consider aggregation as a way of just expanding the sales, maybe getting new customers, um, because you're already incurring those costs. So there, I just said the same thing twice. You should remember it. <laughs> I'm interested to hear your thoughts just maybe on a step back of, of looking at what should a veg, it seems like you're mostly vegetable farmers here, but what should a vegetable farmer focus on to build a sustainable, you know, lifestyle, financial and otherwise just for their own, their lifestyle itself, considering the options of farmer's market versus direct sales, CSA, maybe glumped together versus selling wholesale to some sort of irrigation. And secondarily, I was a little confused in the, in the presentation is the, is that when you refer to aggregation, is that mostly for the purposes of your study here, uh, the farm market share, or there, is there some sort of other aggregation including in that separate of a farmer's market share? No, oh, that's a great question. I'll start with that first. Aggregation in this instance is you're involved in the farmer's market or you engage in their aggregation project where they're using an online portal uh, where a customer could, could, could buy a market share or they could buy bok choy from you a la carte, right? Onions, right? So at the market level, there's gonna be a listing of all the vendors and all their products available. And me as a customer, I can order whatever I want, right? So don't think that it's, it's only just a market share that's an assembled, assembled box, although that was a popular thing. Jane, did I get that right? I'm pointing to you because you're like. Yes, that's correct, Ryan. And I'm, I'm just going to share a screen to one of the online stores so people can see what it looks like here. Um, so and this so is the Grand Rapids Farmers Market um, online store at this moment. And we are in the winter, so there isn't a ton of produce. But here's an example of bakery items. Um, we do have meat items, um, honey and syrups. And so people can, people can order a market share box like Ryan mentioned, which is during the season and that's assembled for the customer by the market staff. But people can also go on this catalog and order, you know, a piece at a time, whatever they want. Yeah. So it's more like a cons this your model here is more like a consignment almost like the, the f vendor puts it available to the market the market has this marketing conglomerate put together and then they will gather that customer's order for them almost like a little instacart type service did you consider anything like a good acre um where they're just buying wholesale and selling and reselling it as an aggregator or is that viewed more as just straight wholesale in your in your model yeah so when i when i was presenting what we're how people sold product and that part that was wholesale, that was, that was good, a good acre model. Either you're selling through a farm or you're selling wholesale uh, through a wholesaler, right? Uh, this is when I'm talking about aggregation, what Jane's showing here, these are what I'm calling aggregation sales. So some of the, some of the 17 very much had food hub sales, which I'm calling wholesale sales. Uh, so we're kind of mixing, <laughs> we're, we're, we're mixing some, some terminology here just to make that clear. But to your larger point, um, my advice is, again, I really think that in order to be successful, I really think that there's magic in managing that marketing mix well, right? So this is what I end up, this is what I see. This is, this is, the world according to Ryan. I got, I got nothing to back this up, but my observations, although I look at this kind of stuff and I think about it. Um, some people very early uh, in their career as a vegetable operator have this tendency to do just everything. And they end up doing a lot of things badly <laughs> as opposed to doing a few things well. And maybe that's just a natural progression. Maybe people just need to do that to find where their sweet spot is. But people need to get to a sweet spot where it's not just I'm growing things efficiently. That's, that's a whole nother presentation. But I'm managing, I'm, I'm growing a sizable enough customer base and then I'm selling everything, right? 
The key would be I can stack these market channels in a way that it's efficient and I'm basically selling all that I can, right? Because I, I think what's going on is there is so much lost revenue that just sits in a field, right? If 30% of a crop is just left in the field because, uh oh, I don't have a market for it, or I actually, what's honestly the case is I can't manage my markets well, that I can't match up my production with my sales well, you have inefficiency and you have, you, you lose profit because you dumped a lot of money into raising a third of that tomato crop and a third of the tomato crop, crop just rotted in the field. Uh, if those were sold and they could have been sold, if you manage those market channels well, you stacked, stacked those, you found that right mix of wholesale and CSA or CSA and farmer's market or four farmer's markets so that you can sell whatever you're producing and you match it up with your production, that, that's, uh, that's where I think it's a sweet spot. Does that make sense? Yeah, Ryan. Um, so yeah, that whenever you're doing something, you're not doing something else. So that's that opportunity cost. Um, but there's a question here from Helene. Could you describe um, what the uh, average customer looked like for this? And Jane, maybe you know better for your, the two markets that you um, are participating in. Yeah, so what kind of people or organizations were buying aggregated products, individuals or restaurants? Um, in the first couple years of this project, 2018 and 2019, the customers these markets were pursuing were the wholesale buyers, uh, schools particularly, and uh, some sales to restaurants and hospitals and nursing homes. Um, and as you saw from the data Ryan presented, that that wasn't getting us real far. It wasn't catching on like we hoped it had or would. And in 2020, um, really it was individuals who were buying, not restaurants, because restaurants were shut down a lot of the time. Um, not schools, because schools were, you know, doing remote learning and, and school lunches were really complicated. So really the 2020 data reflects individuals. I know that um, out of the Wabasha market, um, and Sarah George is on, you can jump on, but we, um, we did see in the fall an uptick from uh, the local school district um, ordering uh, quite a few apples. And just last week, so over a thousand pounds, over 1500 pounds of turkey product. So, um, those schools are still feeding um, children. So that, that was a big jump. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We are at two o'clock. Uh, if anyone has any other questions they want to pitch to Ryan and stay on for a few minutes, that's yeah. fine. But we are at two. And so uh, thank you all for joining. This has been recorded and it will be posted on the um, farmersmarkethub.org website. And keep that uh, Farmers Market Hub uh, URL handy. Uh, if we do find funding to go back to those uh, farms and see what the year over year to 2020 ended up, if we'll scratch through the couch cushions to see if there's change, but that would be um, I think really enlightening if we had the funding for Ryan to go back and, and capture those individual farm numbers for 2020, so. That might be reasonable we could at least just do the, the market outlet, you know, the marketing mix. Right. Thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna do 17 fin packs again. <laughs> <laughs> Where and how much money is in the couch cushions, Ryan? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, People find money in couch thing. cushions for many projects for me lately. I don't <laughs> I'm trying to stop them. So, other Hi, just, anybody else hanging on here? 
Yep. This is James. I have just one, um, James Heron from the visa working on a project with Rooting Countryside, Smith, Minnesota Farmers Market Association and um, Sustainable Farming Association. I just have one like logistical question. Who, um, who is doing all of the work to do the aggregation? Is it Renewing the Countryside? Is it MISA? Or um, can I just have some background on who is doing this work? Uh, so James, your, your question is who, who are the boots on the ground at the farmer's markets doing this? Exactly, yeah. Is it the, just the managers who are doing this? Right. Work? Yeah, um, the the grant funding from the specialty crop block grants um, provided stipends for the markets to pay uh, managers to manage and then also the percentage markup that the markets were adding to products offered on those uh, online stores also contributed to manager pay. So yeah, there's a there's a whole other presentation to be put together and, um, and analyzed and developed about how the markets can afford to pay those managers to do that work. Okay, very cool. Thank you. Well, there we go. All right. I Properly think we're bored going. everybody to death here. No, no. What, what do we call this week between Christmas and New Year's? It should have a name. Don't you think? It's like Gap Week or something. Does it have a name? No? You want to say it's ketchup, but you're never doing the ketchup. I mean. <laughs> oh, it's ketchup week. Right, I mean, like that red stuff in the bottle, or just <laughs> <laughs> doesn't ever happen. Oh, okay. I think it's pick pine needles out of your carpet week. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. That's right. That's <laughs> now we are seriously losing people fast. So I think we should probably um, let this go. Um, thank you, everybody that's still sticking around for participating, and um, we'll get this, maybe edit this part out. Who knows? Yeah, just. just... <laughs> hey, Ryan, nice to see you. Good to see Good you. Night. Thank Thanks you. Good to see everybody. You. Happy holidays. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Yeah.